I'm Bill Ramsey, and I'm honored to be interviewing Ken tonight. In your behalf, we'll do Q&A at the end of the session and try to be out of here in about an hour. It's always wise to know your audience, and so I wanted to ask a couple of questions before I turn to Ken. With a show of hands, how many out there occasionally read a book? <laughs> how many out there, with another show of hands, occasionally drink a beer? Oh, now, now that's not 100%. How many occasionally read a book while drinking a beer? There you go. That's my kind of people. Mark, write their names down. <laughs> this is an outstanding book. I read this book a few months ago at the behest of the committee and wrote a review for the newspaper. I've talked about it to many, many people that I've met. When I first opened the pages of the book, I thought, He's going to have 200 pages of self-promotion about Sierra Nevada. It really isn't that. This is the true-to-life story of a man who put it all on the line, came from humble beginnings, put it all on the line, and grew the business that we so welcome here in Henderson County. As I like to put it, he's brought enjoyment and employment to Henderson County. So welcome. I'd like to start, Ken, by asking you to disclose, as you do in the book, something about your early childhood. You were the middle child of three. Correct. With a traveling father. Describe your childhood in L.A., I think. Yep, Southern California. Uh, and my father wasn't home much. He was a, an attorney and uh, had a, a line of work that took him around the country. So um, pretty much grew up uh, in a home without a father. And then my parents got divorced uh, a, a little while later. So. Um, I had a, a lot of early influences. My next door neighbor was a, um, I actually was a principal and then I ended up becoming uh, very high up in the Board of Education in um, LA sco City School Systems. Um, and my other neighbor up the street, whose son and I were best friends, was a, a rocket scientist, actually a metallurgist. Um, and he was a very accomplished home brewer, home winemaker. Um, and from a very early age, I was um, playing with uh, my, my best friend at, at his house, and there'd be jugs bubbling in the kitchen. And on, on the weekends, he'd be boiling things on the stove that would overflow and spill onto the, to the stove, and his wife would be screaming at him, and all these interesting smells and aromas. So I was introduced to uh, the, the brewing process and fermentation, the alchemy of of uh, producing something from natural raw materials from a really early age. And you had a, an older brother and a younger sister. I had an older brother and younger sister, and, and my brother uh, actually works for me now. He's my uh, inter international sales uh, representative, so he travels uh, uh, to foreign countries and, and uh, gets in involved in doing beer dinners. and. Uh, he's the, the brewery ambassador, at least that's one of the titles that he has. Uh, he does a lot of those things that I don't have time to do, and he, he represents uh, the family as well. Well, because this is autobiographical, I just had the impression that you were an unconventional young man, but I didn't get the impression that you were a bad kid uh, just because you took home appliances apart and sometimes fail to get them back together again, that sort of thing? I think if you spoke to my mother, there were times when I was a bad kid. Um, <laughs> um, I, I was pretty unconventional. I uh, was uh, very inquisitive, and I did uh, dismantle most of the home appliances at some point in my life, uh, robbing parts out of the washing machine to make a project. Um, so I got into a fair amount of trouble. Um, I was, uh, I guess, not a troubled youth, but I got into a lot of trouble. Um, I, I had a, a very wise and, and caring grandfather who was a Superior Court judge. And so as I was growing up, um, uh, he, uh, in some ways, was, was a father figure for me, as well as my uh, next door neighbor, who was the, the, the board, ed, board of Education um, uh, person. Um, and and the, the home brewer, metallurgist, uh, they had a lot of influence on my early years. Um, I spent a lot of time in the shop at my uh, uh, neighbor's house. The, the Board of Education person, John, uh, was a tinkerer and, and well ahead of his time as far as uh, inventing things. And uh, his car, he had a, a Buick station wagon that he installed every imaginable gadget. Uh, 
uh, well ahead of him. things that came came many years later. He could pump his tires up while he was driving, and he he had uh, no room under his hood when he was done with a car. And so I, I learned a lot about mechanics from him. And then the the, the, the metallurgist, home brewer. He was a, uh, a cyclist and a mountain climber, and so he would take um, the neighborhood kids on these extended backpacking trips in the Sierra. Um, and, 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 and as you'll see as we go along here. A lot of what Ken did with appliances around the home, he later did in the startup brewing operation. All these skills that he learned were survival skills, as it turned out, but we'll get there. Your early work experience, you went to work as a junior in high school? or um, Yes, I, uh, I discovered uh, girls, and um, my, uh, my mother at that point was a single, single mom, and uh, she was working as a social worker and didn't have a lot of money. Um, and I decided I, I wanted to be able to take my, my girlfriend out, and so I got a job so I could uh, go out to dinner every once in a while and uh, uh, supply myself with things I needed for backpacking and, and camping. So I started working in bicycle shops. Uh, actually, before that, I, I worked as a, uh, as a helper in a furniture store when I was, I think, 14, and then um, moved on to uh, being a mechanic, learning how to repair bicycles, and ultimately was able to support myself when I moved to Chico. To, to the extent that any class in conventional school appealed to you, what would that have been? What subject? Um, I spent uh, a lot of time with photography, actually, and I, I built a dark room at a pretty young age um, and was doing a lot of, uh, of printing and, and got into uh, a lot of black and white stuff as well as a little bit of color. Um, and then certainly tinkering and welding. I had a, a convinced my mother to, uh, to buy me a welder at a very young age and then ended up building a, uh, my, my own little uh, room out behind the house and, and uh, went and got a building permit. I was the youngest person, I'm sure, to get a building permit in uh, Southern California and built my own little shed that I lived in for many years. And you, you, you kind of liked chemistry too, didn't you? Uh, that was a little bit later. Um, okay. we, uh, although uh, the, the metallurgist neighbor was a, uh, a person who um, thought if he provided a, a lot of, of tools for his kids um, that they would learn a lot. So he actually built a laboratory for uh, the neighborhood kids. And we, we had all sorts of things that today would be considered uh, um, probably not the right thing to let kids experiment with. So we had uh, mercury and gunpowder and you know, all, all, all sorts of uh, you know, things that are now highly, highly controlled uh, at our disposal. And so we were into all sorts of uh, experiments that blew up. And, and you, did your, you did your first batch of home brew between your junior and senior year? Yes. Um, okay. I, uh, set up a little uh, fermentation, a, a gallon jug in my closet and hid it to my mother and, and she thought the odors coming out of my bedroom were just the, the odors of a 15 year old. But uh, and, <laughs> This man moved to Chico in a way that you wouldn't expect. He skipped his high school graduation to go hiking in the mountains. Yep. And, and basically ended up, you went with friends. Yeah, I went, I went hiking and then took a trip up to uh, uh, help move a couple of friends to Chico State. Uh, they were a year ahead of me and, and were attending Chico State. And I was starting a bike tour um, down the coast of California and, and I had them give me a ride up to Northern California. And as part of that trip, I fell in love with Chico and, and got on my bike and rode around town and uh, applied at a couple of bike shops and got a job offer. And, Phoned my mother. I was only 17. Phoned my mother and said, "I'm not coming home. I'm I'm moving to Chico with my friends." And um, she was a, a bit horrified, but uh, there wasn't a lot she could do at that point to try right. to keep me home. And I know later on, you in searching for the right location for your brewery, you considered other cities in California, but ended up going back to Chico. Yeah, we'd looked, uh, uh, we wanted to be in a college town, and so we looked at uh, a, a lot of areas. San Luis Obispo was one of the, the places in, in uh, the middle of California. Um, they had water issues, and, and uh, we looked in the mountains uh, in Nevada City, which wasn't a college town, but which had a lot of uh, tourism, um, and decided that you know, the practicality of operating from a little mountain community might be pretty challenging, and eventually decided, well, we'll just stay where we're at in Chico. And you, you studied, you considered studying at Chico State. I actually but, did study at Chico State. But, but uh, you started, did you start at Butte Community College? You're right, I, I started at Butte Community College studying chemistry. Um, my interest in science had, had been peaked and how it connected to brewing and, and fermentation. 
Um, and a, a little side story, my chemistry professor, um, George Boggs, uh, who taught at the junior college at that time, ended up moving from there to be the president of Palomar College and then moved to Washington, D.C. and was the head of all the community colleges in the United States, oh. uh, an organization that was uh, supporting him. Um, so he was a, a great inspiration for me, really challenged me, and we've stayed in touch over the years. And um, I think, uh, in part, he was a pretty big inspiration in me really digging in and, and trying to focus on, on chemistry. And not being independently wealthy at that stage in your life, the decision to go to uh, Butte Community College was, in part, economically based. Is that correct? Most definitely, um, and, and just um, all three of my children, uh, they've all graduated from other uh, institutions, but all three of them went and graduated from Butte Community College as well. So they, they've all had the community college start in their life. And for those that are out there considering where to start their college careers, start at Blue Ridge Community College. <laughs> just a plug, Molly, do I get paid extra for that tonight, Molly? Uh, as you tried to earn your way through, um, the early years, you got into a bi bicycle repair shop. Yeah, I, uh, I worked my way through college. Um, my, my parents gave me a little bit of support, $100 a month, which uh, just covered rent. And I had to uh, work to, um, to eat. And um, I had the skill of repairing bicycles. And then later on, I got offered the, the position of managing one of the bike shops that I was working at. And I dropped out of uh, um, Chico State. I'd transferred to Chico State at that point. And, Ran the bike shop for a few years and then decided with the, the input from my neighbor, I was home brewing and he thought I made great beer and he said, you should open a little home brew supply store. There's a lot of people right. who, who would like to learn how to brew beer. So I opened this little business in 1976, um, selling grapes and malt and, and hops and things to brew beer. Yeah. And um, my wife and I ran that um, and it was not a really uh, viable business per se. We, at a really good day, we'd make maybe $40 uh, in sales, and out of that, maybe $15 was profit. And uh, so I had, had to continue to work in the bike shop, and my, uh, my first child, Sierra, was born uh, when we had the homebrew shop, so my wife would be uh, taking care of a, a two-month-old baby, uh, trying to deal with people uh, asking her to taste their beer and tell her what was wrong with it. And, and, and besides the fact that she hates beer, um, she, she doesn't drink any alcohol. It's not that she just hates beer. She, she doesn't drink any alcohol. Um, she would say, it all tastes terrible. And that was probably not, not, not the best thing for the business. Um, so she, she eventually uh, decided that maybe she shouldn't be uh, you know, raising our, our uh, newborn child in the homebrew shop. Now you did uh, uh, what's called homesteading. You had goats, you made goat cheese, you did the home brew. What was the homesteading experience like? Uh, we had always been um, you know, very involved in food production. So we always had gardens. Uh, we started raising goats and chickens uh, at a pretty young age. My, my wife was also very uh, engaged in, in that process. And, uh, I made beer. We we made uh, you know, our, our kids were raised on goat milk. They hate it now, but, uh, but uh, all, all through the years growing up, and we still have chickens and, and we still have uh, some animals. We're not doing goats anymore, but we raised all of our own poultry, so we had a, a small chicken farm as well. Now, when I first read the book, and you corrected me on this, I thought that you named Sierra Nevada after your daughter Sierra. It turns out the beer was named after the mountains, and right. she was too, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we spent uh, quite a bit of time. I, I spent a lot of my, my early youth uh, with my, uh, my, my metallurgist uh, friend's father, um, um, hiking and camping and, and doing a little bit of rock climbing. And when my wife and I got together in 1973, uh, we actually enrolled in some rock climbing classes together. And we started to, two of us, do some climbing. And um, not that we got to the Sierra as much as we would love to, but uh, we did get up there and really enjoyed the, the Alpine Mountains. One of the things that I was struck by as he started this business, you know, you'll hear people say timing is everything. Well, in the uh, late 70s, about that time frame, craft brewers were collapsing, went from, according to the book, 3,000 to about 40 survivors, and that was the time you chose to get in. Right, uh, yeah, it, it didn't look so good. Um, in, in, in actuality, they weren't called craft brewers back then. Right. So before Prohibition, there were something uh, like 3,000 breweries in America. 
um, uh, well, actually, right before Prohibition, maybe not, not that many, maybe 1,500 or, or so. After Prohibition, about half of them reopened, so there was seven or 800 breweries in operation after Prohibition, and they were considered sort of legacy breweries. They, they were you know, old brewing families, typically, and, and uh, they had been struggling, and, and with uh, mass marketing that was being done, television, radio, um, the advent of, of good roads and transportation, brewers could distribute nationally. And up until that point, most beer was just sold uh, really locally. Um, but once the transportation system and advertising, um, the, the more aggressive brewers, the um, Anheuser-Busch and right. Schlitz and Stroh and, and Miller, and uh, well, actually pre-Miller even, um, once they started to really dominate the landscape, um, the small brewers struggled to be competitive. Um, most of the brewers started to brew the same kind of beer that the big brewers were brewing because they thought that that was where the, the future of beer was. Um, by the year we started, um, uh, 1980, the industry had hit its low point pretty much that time. There was only about 40 breweries left, a little over 40 breweries. Um, and most of those were um, still small, struggling family breweries, but were rapidly closing. And um, it got down to a point where um, there were some industry experts that predicted that by the year 2000, there may only be two breweries left in America. Um, and beer was becoming very much a commodity, somewhat like milk, where you don't really necessarily always go shop for a brand of milk. You, you know, buy a, a product. Well, for, for those of, like me that have been around long enough and drinking beer over the years, we call those the dark days of beer. <laughs> we, lived, we lived in Cincinnati at that time, and you may remember some of these names. They just collapsed one after another. Berger, Hudipole, Shingling, and Wiedemann, and they were all gone. Um, I, I, I sadly, uh, I, I joined the Brewers Association of America in 1981 or 82, and I knew Bob Pohl from Hudipole. Um I knew uh, the folks from uh, Shenling. Uh, they were going to these conferences, and, and I would go, and it was uh, like the, the, the old survivors club. So every year at the convention, there'd be like three less breweries or five less right. breweries. And then most of the time, people were just telling stories about how tough it was and, and how you know, so-and-so couldn't make it anymore. Um, yeah. So it was pretty sad. And, and uh, as you mentioned, for me, starting then, um, I, I wrote a business plan in 1977. And we were hoping to open our brewery for about $50,000. And the, the model we were following was based on a, a small brewery who had opened up in Sonoma, California, called New Albion. And that had been really the, the first new American sort of uh, upstart uh, craft brewery uh, since Prohibition. And they had gone from home brewing to brewing about a barrel and a half, 45 gallon batches. And as a home brewer, I was pretty interested in that. So I, I made a couple of pilgrimages over to, to meet the owner, Jack McAuliffe, and um, saw what he was doing. It was pretty much the same amount of beer I was brewing as a home brewer. And I, I saw that he had built a little mash town, a little kettle, and little fermenters. And that uh, really said, uh, you know, I can do that too. Uh, sure. It's not that hard. And so I made the decision in 1978 to sell the homebrew shop, uh, wrote a business plan, started going to, to banks looking for money. Um, they thought I was nuts. And yep. uh, if you were a banker who had done any research, you would look at the U.S. brewing industry and see that breweries are closing at a rate of, you know, uh, five or ten a year, and there's no new ones opening. And why would you ever give money to somebody wanting to open a brewery? Now, in the early days, you had a partner. I had a partner. He was one of my homebrew shop customers, and uh, he was a, a cyclist a buddy of my brother's. Um, I also spent a little bit of time riding and racing bikes, and my brother got into that, and, and one of his uh, riding partners was uh, a home brewer and was visiting me in Chico and said, we should open a brewery. And he had a little more money than I did. and, and um, Not much, but a little. Not much, but um, I thought, yeah, that's what we should do. So I uh, put the home brew shop up on the market and, and said, put this business plan together and try to find money. We've had partnerships in, in our business history, and the only partnership that's ever worked out sitting right out there tonight, mm -hmm. so 48 years worth. Uh, you were a hands-on guy and may still be, I don't know, but yep. describe some of the things that you did to save money and get the operation rolling. Well, when we were starting to, to design and construct the brewery in, in 19, uh, well, starting in 1978, uh, we were very fortunate that UC Davis was just down the road from us and UC Davis was really the only brewing university in the U.S. Uh, at, at the time. And so I made a lot of trips to UC Davis, and I spent hours and hours in their library. I photostatted every old periodical they had. 
and we had been uh, wisely counseled that we, you know, we probably were going to be brewing with technology from the 50s or, or sort of in that, that league and that uh, we didn't have a lot of sophistication or money and so we should make top fermented bottle conditioned beers and, and uh, I, I spent a, a lot of time understanding you know, that level of technology, uh, quite a step from being a home brewer uh, to, to trying to do it commercially. And um, you couldn't just go buy a little mash tun or buy a little kettle. So I built everything myself. Um, I re-enrolled in the junior college again. And they had a pretty active agricultural welding fabrication machine shop program. And I became good friends with the, the teachers there and uh, convinced them that my little agricultural project of building a brewery was, uh, was something that fit into their, their plan. And um, I ended up uh, using forklifts and learning how to weld. And I learned how to weld stainless steel. And they offered uh, uh, some trade courses in refrigeration. So I took the refrigeration classes, the wiring classes on electrical installation. Uh, electronics, uh, computer science, uh, although it was pretty early, I did take computer and business classes. Um, so I, uh, you know, after going from Butte College at Chico State, I went back to Butte College and, and spent several years uh, learning and, and building the brewery. And you bought a lot of used equipment where you could find it, uh, tanks from dairies, uh, fill lines from soft drink bottlers, German brewing lines that were decommissioned. Um, yeah, I mean, back in those days, what had happened with the, the small U.S. brewing industry or the, the sort of the, the heritage brewers was happening in the U.S. dairy industry as well, where there were a lot of family farms that had 30 head of cattle or 30, head, 30 cows, and they were doing small little milking operations, and they were struggling to, to do it on a competitive scale. So there was lots of pumps and pipes and tanks uh, available in the dairy communities. So I, I had a, a 57 Chevy one-ton flatbed truck that was my, uh, uh, my only vehicle, and uh, I would drive up and down through uh, Central California into Oregon and Washington, and I'd go to little dairy communities and go to the feed store, and I'd say, you know where any dairies might have uh, closed in the last few years, and go knock on doors, and, and uh, you, know, you talk to one dairy guy, and he said, oh yeah, you know, check, check so-and-so, I think they've got an old tank. And so I scrounged all of our early equipment pretty much from old dairies. And you found out that the welds in the dairy tanks were not suitable for beer. No, actually the welds in the dairy tanks were, were suitable for okay. beer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the winery guys uh, can get by with a lot lower hygiene, but the standards for the dairy industry are very high and, and uh, were generally much better than the brewing industry had been at that point. Um, the, the dairy industry is you know, controlled by uh, inspections and, and three A requirements where wine and, and beer really hadn't been uh, to that level. One of the things that used to happen that no longer does is used to have long neck glass bottles that were returned and refilled. Tell us about your use of long of uh, reused glass long neck bottles. Yeah, our, our first uh, uh, bottling line came from an old soft drink plant I found up in Mount Vernon, Washington. And it had a real bottle washer where you could, uh, you know, in the olden days, return your soda bottles. And so we uh, chose to have a returnable bottle. And, uh, and our vision was pretty small. Uh, my original business plan called for us to brew 2,500 barrels a year. And uh, actually, 1,500 initially up to 2,500 was our, our, uh, our growth strategy. And we thought we could charge, you know, nickel deposit, uh, $1.20 a case, and get all of our bottles back and rewash the, the bottles and reuse them. And so I uh, went and found some closed breweries, and we bought uh, thousands of cases of long neck bar bottles with the idea that would last us forever. And uh, after a matter of months, um, people didn't return the bottles like we were expecting. And we started running out of bottles, and, and I would spend my off hours digging through the dumpsters behind uh, Mexican restaurants, because uh, some of the Mexican beer bottles were really close to the, uh, to the long neck bottle. And so w when we got tight, we would refill um, um, old Mexican Dos Equis bottles. As a small brewery at that time, you were always last in line for key ingredients, hops being one that varies from crop year to crop year, with crops being at a high level one year and way down the next. Mm -hmm. What was it like to be last in line? Well, when, when I uh, had my homebrew shop, actually I made my first pilgrimage to Yakima, Washington, and most of the hops in America are growing around the Yakima Valley, some in Oregon, but Yakima's the, the biggest center. And I, I drove, uh, at that time I had an old station wagon. Uh, my wife and I took a trip up there and 
I loaded 100 pounds of, of the samples that big brewers would normally get. So when you're a, a big brewer, you would get a one pound sample out of every 50 bales of hops. Well, I bought those one pound samples, uh, which was uh, plenty for me to run my homebrew shop. Um, so I was exposed to, to the Yakima Valley and to hop growing. And, and as we started to grow, uh, you know, we're, we were certainly disadvantaged, but we were viewed as being, you know, a sort of acute part of the industry. And so we got uh, made friends and, and got uh, support for the raw, ma raw materials pretty early. Now you talked about your first batches and the need to have them be consistent, which is a difficult thing to, to achieve because there is so much chemistry involved, but that was a standard that you never varied from. Um, we, we dumped uh, many batches of beer when we first started up in, in 1980, and, and uh, uh, we've also dumped many batches of beer here in, in North Carolina. Um, not that we're proud of it, but we you know, really wanted to make sure that we had a product that could be indistinguished from what we brewed in Chico. And uh, for, for some um, months, uh, certainly many, many weeks, we would send uh, three days a week beers from North Carolina to Chico and beers from Chico to North Carolina blind and we would both taste them in both of our taste panels, and uh, uh, we wanted to get to the point where nobody could say, well, that tastes like North Carolina, that tastes like Chico, and, and uh, we got there, but it, it, it took quite a few batches to get there. There was a point at which you hired a distributor. Uh, explain that, because prior to that time, you actually did the deliveries. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, alcoholic, the, the alcoholic beverage laws in this country are um, very different state by state. After prohibition, every state was able to set up their own criteria for distribution of alcohol. Um, and so when we're selling beer in California or in Oregon or in North Carolina, uh, we're dealing with that state's uh, alcoholic distribution laws. We're also you know, under the federal government uh, laws as well. Um, in California, you are allowed to self-distribute, and um, that's not uh, necessarily allowed in every state. So if we had been in a state where we couldn't distribute our own beer, we probably wouldn't have had enough profit margin uh, in our early days to stay in business. And uh, so California being a state that did allow distribution, we distributed day one, um, and we still do. We have. Uh, distribution just for our own, own home market in Chico. Okay. Um, outside of that, we then started to branch out. We went to San Francisco, and we had to hire a beer distributor who, um, uh, you know, hopefully takes your beer to the, the, the bars and restaurants and stores and sells it for you. Um, we had some real challenges in the early days, and we still have some challenges. But uh, you know, distributors are necessary for our business model to get our beer in, into far-flung markets. Well, one of the one of the challenges you had was that demand began to outstrip supply, and so you were shuffling around and filling orders. Describe that process. Um, we were uh, we were struggling our first uh, year or two to convince people to take our beer, and. Uh, uh, I went out, um, you know, first day we had our first beer we thought was, was really great and consistent and something we could duplicate, and we had a, a, an old, I think it was a 72 uh, Chevy van, and, and uh, we took the seats out of it, and um, we drove down our, our, our hometown uh, streets and, and went to the bars and restaurants, and we were in a position we couldn't afford to have six packs. We didn't have enough money to have them printed. And so we had, uh, you know, single bottles. We would go up and say, you know, try my beer and, and buy my beer. And uh, we were able to convince a handful of restaurants to take our, take our beer. Um, as we, uh, you know, c continued to grow and expand, uh, that became more and more challenging. But, um, you know, early on it was, we did everything from um, making the beer to, to, uh, to distributing it. We were fortunate that one of the large grocery store um, beer buyers, his daughter was going to Chico State. And so in uh, the early 80s, he would come by the brewery and um, you know, he was just curious. And we would sit down on, on the, the seat out of our van and uh, we would taste beer together. And um, he started to say, wow, this is really interesting. And, and he started running ads in the, the Safeway circulars. Um, and that was just a huge shot in our arm. We had no you know, control or knowledge. The ads would show up, we'd run out of beer. Um, and, and then r r right about that time, uh, the uh, San Francisco Examiner magazine did a feature story on us, um, um, many color pages, and had, uh, I think the headline was, the beer that's making Chico famous. And it was uh, another big shot in our arm. And at that point, we just couldn't make enough beer. We were brewing around the clock and, and uh, trying to make more and more beer with our, our really pretty small, humble equipment. 
And so in 1983, I went to Germany and found a shuttered brewery over there that was a uh, hundred barrel size, so ten times the size we were, we were brewing at that time. Um, started to draft up new plans and we had this big expansion in mind. Um, I went over with my high school buddy to Germany and hired a couple of Germans and the company that made the equipment originally and we took it all out. Um, the, the same thing that had happened in the U.S. with breweries going out of business was happening in Germany. Yeah. About one brewery a week was closing in Bavaria alone. And so you could find these old, beautiful copper brew houses for just pennies on the dollar, just for the scrap price of the copper. And so for uh, less than $15,000, I think we bought all this equipment. Uh, by the time we got it shipped to California, it was much more than that. It was about $60,000 we had invested. And then we went back to banks, wrote a new business plan, went back to the banks. They still wouldn't loan us any money. And um, so the equipment sat in crates uh, in Chico for many years. Um, as we figured out how to make more and more beer out of our, our little plant, and we eventually got up to about 12,000 barrels. And at that point, we had enough of a track record in 1987 that uh, we were able to borrow a little bit of money from the SBA and some family and friends and, and do the next expansion. In 1988, you're, like so many do, your partnership kind of came apart, well, but it took 10 more years to, to deal with the money side of that issue. Yeah, in 1988, as we got into the new facility, my, my partner was not as uh, excited about the business and uh, was a bit challenged about just the growth we had had and, and the, the complexity of the operation. And we, we now had, um, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 people in production versus the 10 or 15 we had before. Um, and so he wasn't working um, uh, very hard and wasn't too engaged in sort of our future. And so we started to have discussions about, well, maybe it's time for us to figure out how to, you know, part ways. And, and we started working on it in, in um, the late 80s. And it wasn't until almost the late 90s that we finally uh, resolved things and, and we moved on. Because some of your money was coming from family people, right. particularly on his side. And they, they saw a good thing. They didn't want to let go was the impression I had. Well, I mean, we started out, uh, the two of us each owned 35 percent, and our families each owned 15 percent. That was the division. So we, we knew enough to, to try to keep things balanced, whether that was good or, or bad in the end. It's hard to say because we were at a stalemate when it finally came down to you know, control the company. It was 50-50. Um, both of uh, my partner and my father were attorneys. Um, both of our parents had been divorced, and um, both of them didn't really give us the best advice, probably. Um, uh, we'd never completed a buy-sell agreement. There was one that had been started years before, and as attorneys, as, as parents and attorneys sometimes do, they procrastinated. And um, so that never got resolved, and, and we didn't have that um, to sort of go back to. Um, so it became uh, a number of years of, of struggle to, to resolve that, but it, it finally happened. Somewhere during that time frame, at about the 25-year mark, you gave some serious consideration to just selling out. Is that correct? Yeah, there, there came a point where um, I was, uh, I had been working, you know, steadily really from the, the, the building of the brewery till that point, almost 30 years. And um, I was uh, a, a little bit sort of burned out, I guess. Um, we had uh, experienced, you know, tremendous growth and, and our business was, was doing well. Um, but there, there got to be a point where, you know, is this what I'm going to do till I die? And my kids at that point uh, uh, weren't that interested in, in uh, being sort of the next generation. Um, all of my children had worked at the brewery, whether they were washing dishes in the restaurant or cleaning glassware in the laboratory. Uh, my daughter, Sierra, was a receptionist, answered phones, and they had all uh, worked part-time jobs during college. Um, but my, my son had decided to become a sheriff and had enrolled in uh, police academy. And my uh, daughter had gone uh, to get a degree in, in uh, my oldest daughter in, um, in health education. She was going to be a nurse. And my middle daughter uh, got her master's in social work, and it seemed like they were all off on their, their own things, and that was fine. Uh, I didn't want to push anybody into right. the business. And so I thought, well, uh, maybe it's a good time that, that uh, I step aside. And um, when they got word of that, they were like, no, you can't do that. Uh, you know, we'll take over. So um, uh, two of the three stepped up and said, uh, no, we, we want to have it be a family company going into the future, and we'll, we'll get involved. 
and your and your son would be here tonight, but for the fact that he's he's the best man at a wedding tomorrow in California. In California, so, you know, so. yeah, he he moved to North Carolina, um, and he and his uh, his wife and my uh, my fourth grandchild are in California. You've got a lifelong reputation for being a good guy to work for with 401ks, health insurance, wellness, on-site clinics. Uh, what's your employer philosophy? Well, um, I, I had some bad employers when I was uh, um, growing up and working at the bike shop, uh, and I actually talked about one of them in the book. Um, and, and so I saw a lot of what I didn't want to do, and uh, you know, I've always felt strong that you know, I, I would want to run a company that I would want to work at, and uh, so we've, we've tried hard to, uh, to make that happen. Um, we don't always uh, maybe achieve the end, but we, you know, we try, and, and we've done a lot, and, and um, you know, there's always some people who are not going to be satisfied with whatever, but uh, you know, our goal is to try to provide uh, you know, uh, good, good pay, good benefits, um, we do have in our, our Chico Brewery, we have an on-site doctor, we have a, a health clinic there that's free to employees and families to walk in any time. We've got uh, daycare uh, that's subsidized on the, uh, on the site. Um, we've got a full-time massage therapist and, and wellness program. Um, so, and, and you get free beer. Um, <laughs> um, so we've, we, we've tried to, to uh, cover most of the needs. You were environmentally conscious before it was fashionable, too. I, in the book, I saw that you were always interested in power and water self-sufficiency. You had generators so that no time and no beer would be lost. You covered the Chico parking lot with solar panels, providing shade for the parked cars and power for the plant. Where did all that come from? Well, I mean, it, it, uh, it came a little bit from, um, I guess, my upbringing. My, my grandfather was really, uh, the judge was really a frugal guy, and uh, he would always say, waste not, want not, was sort of his, uh, his mantra. He'd lived through the Depression and, and really um, you know, tried to instill in us, you know, let's, let's be careful with what we're, we're using as resources. Um, and then as I built the initial brewery, I didn't have any money, so I had to recycle everything. I mean, the whole brewery was built out of used equipment. I, I don't think there was one new thing other than maybe a gasket or something. Uh, everything was used equipment in the brewery. And uh, the, the make-do and the resourcefulness, I think, was part of our success and that we learned how to, to make do with what we, we had. And um, I think that stuck, stuck with us. And, you know, saving money, uh, saving energy go hand in hand, and um, you know, saving resources sort of have always fit with our lifestyle. Um, you know, we were say early, um, uh, early people who who you know did a lot on our own and, and had a real connection to nature. One of the things that you've done that impressed me so was <clears throat> that you've maintained all these friendly relationships with people in the industry, people that many people in your situation could have described as competitors that you never wanted to talk to, never wanted to share anything about the beer making process with, but that's just not your style. Well, I mean, it's, it's not my style and it really, uh, the, the brewing industry, uh, at least the craft industry, really has a, a real different uh, approach. And I think probably the, the major brewers years ago had the same kind of uh, brotherhood, at least certainly the brewers did. Maybe the marketing guys hated each other. But the, uh, the, the brewers used to help each other out. And you know, going back to when we first started, uh, I, I leaned heavily on, um, I mentioned Jack McAuliffe at New Albion, but also Fritz Maytag, who right. had purchased the Anchor Brewery. Um, they would let me come down any time and um, you know, hang out and, and learn. And, and I bought a lot of old equipment as they outgrew it. Um, so I think brewers tend to help brewers. Um, the craft industry has probably really taken that to another level where you know, we have actually, if I was in Chico today, I have a, a brewer um, from Wisconsin, from uh, Dan Carey from New Glarus Brewing, brewing a batch of beer with our folks uh, in California today. Uh, we're doing this project called Beer Camp Across America, where we're actually making 12 different beers with 12 different brewers, and, and the Asheville Brewers Guilds are one of those 12 beers. Um, and and they'll all be in a 12-pack right. in a store near you. Yep, and uh, so we're the first, I'm sure, in history to have a 12-pack a with you know, 12 partner breweries um, um, in it. Um, and, and we've been, uh, I think, successful as an industry because of, of the camaraderie and the, you know, we, we would like to make uh, great beer available for everyone, whether it's you know, brewed by a small brewery and, 
in Cincinnati or, or you know, brewed by us in California. Or... Well, the, uh, the truth is I haven't been to camp since Boy Scouts in 1954. A couple of days ago I bought a couple of tickets to beer camp up here at Mills River, August 3rd, Sunday afternoon, save that date, one until six. You'll be getting some really good beer and good food and a lot of good company. If you had your life to live over again, would you still brew beer? Um, most definitely. Um, there's uh, really nothing, I mean, it, the, our, our current situation is, uh, you know, we're running a fairly large business and I've got uh, a lot of day-to-day -day challenges and struggles and, and building this, uh, this brewery in Mills River has not been easy. Um, it's uh, uh, a fairly significant uh, milestone in, in my career. It's the largest single thing I've ever done. Um, so it has not been an easy couple of years, and there's there's days when I, I wish I didn't have all this going on, and I could do you know sit back and do something a little less stressful. Um, but the you know the the, the passion and the um, rewards I've gotten with my you know my history in the brewing industry have been great, and um, you know, they haven't been without you know trials and tribulations and, and challenges. But um, it's a uh, exciting time, and and. As I mentioned, when we started, there were only 40 breweries in America. Today, there's nearly 3,000. Uh, a, a new brewery is opening uh, about one and a half breweries a day. Right now is the pace of, of new brewery openings. Um, I, I like to say that uh, in one month, more breweries will open than were in existence when I started. Um, and, and I feel that we really were part of the, the genesis of, of that revolution. Um, our pale ale is the largest selling uh, single brand, at least in grocery stores across the country, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're proud to have been able to, you know, be part of that. I, I wouldn't say, you know, we, we didn't create the whole movement, but certainly we were a significant force. Um, in, in Asheville has, I found this out, Buncombe County, 17 craft brewers at this time. Any craft brewers from the area? Okay, we got a couple down here tonight. I'm gonna run down in the audience and take a few questions so we can get you folks out of here. I've grown thirsty again. <laughs> Got a question over here. Yeah, curious with the reference to Genesis, uh, Richmond County over in eastern North Carolina had uh, at one time um, an opportunity with Coors to come in, I believe on the PD River. Yep. And there was tremendous excitement and build, and then everything kind of went away in a hurry. Have you got any knowledge or why the situation here was you know, As I, it came, yeah, I did hear that they were looking uh, at a number of um, of sites in this area. Um, I, I don't know what the reason they chose uh, Shenandoah, Virginia, was. I mean, one of the things we started out looking for was a, a site that we could be on rail and and uh, have rail right up to the brewery, which would be nice. And we couldn't find a site we wanted to be at that had rail. And uh, we, we did a, a lot of studies of you know where's the best place to site the brewery from. A whole bunch of uh, factors. So you know, community was one of them certainly. Um, but we were looking at water. We were looking at wastewater treatment capacity. We were looking at rail access. We were looking at road uh, road access, climate. Um, you know, do dozens of things went into our our model. Um, and I'm sure they did the same thing and probably looked at a lot of sites and and you know didn't select some for various reasons. Ken, as a home brewer whose well is uh, 405 feet in the ground. I would just like to see if you could talk about water quality for just a moment. Um, yeah, yeah, we were, uh, when we were looking for locations, water was certainly one of the things that we did analyze. Um, we uh, actually, Don Sheldahl's here, and, and uh, we worked with his company to, uh, to locate uh, potential sites around the country. And, um, you know, we, we built this traffic or this distribution model based on our current um, sales uh, in various marketplaces as well as what we anticipated the future growth. And when we narrowed it down, we started looking at, you know, who could supply the quality water we, we wanted and who could handle the, the wastewater. Um, and so it was certainly a factor in the site we ended up with. Uh, 
um, over next to the airport um, did have its own springs. There were there are some still uh, active springs on the property, and so we started doing water analysis really early on. That hadn't been uh, necessarily um, something we. Uh, needed as far as our own wells, we, we certainly needed good water from a municipal supply, and, and the, the city of Asheville's municipal supply was also very good. Um, so uh, we did do uh, test wells. Uh, we dug very deep wells, and um, we came up. Uh, first well we dug was great water, but not very much, like six gallons a minute. Uh, the second well was uh, well over 100 uh, gallons a minute in, in really great water, and then we ended up drilling a third well as a backup. Um, and we've uh, been testing and monitoring and, and monitoring uh, water levels. So it's something that's obviously very important to a brewer. Ken, you've got some uh, guests from Sierra Nevada here. I think they left work early, so you may have to dock them a little bit. Stand up and be recognized, Sierra Nevada people. Great success story. How are you going to avoid the inevitable power play to, to, to acquire you? It's not really a power play that can happen. Um, you know, that, that, that question gets asked every once in a while, how can you prevent being taken over? Well, they'd have to beat me up, but um, you know, we, we're not a publicly traded company. Uh, the, the stock is all owned by um, myself and my family. so. Um, I, I've had plenty of opportunities if I wanted to sell out, and, and you know I, I didn't uh, get into this business uh, for the purpose of making money. I got in for making beer, and my love of, of brewing. Um, you know, hopefully my my kids will will want to continue on into the next generation. And I've got the the third generation on the way. Um, they're more interested in playing with toys right now, but ho hopefully at some point uh, when they're a little older, they'll they'll take an interest in the business. Uh, Ken, how does the uh growth, if any, in Europe of the craft brewery industry uh, impact your plans going forward? So uh, years ago when I started, the American brewing industry was sort of the, the laughing stock um, globally of, of great beer. Um, people would come from Germany and uh, would say, you call this beer in this country, this is more like water. And, and you'd uh, hear a lot of those stories. Um, as uh, the craft brewery um, sort of movement and, and explosion of great beer in America happened, it's actually gone backwards, and now most of the rest of the world is looking at uh, what are they doing in America that's so exciting, and how did they really change their beer culture? Um, I, I um, you know, we, we won uh, a couple years ago um, the top honor gold medal for a, a Pilsner beer that we produced. Um, and actually, Scott Jennings, our, our head brewer here in North Carolina, produced the beer, and we won uh, the top honor against uh, many, many German breweries. And uh, a German TV station came over to interview me, and the title of their uh, their show was "The Death of German Beer." And um, the, they, um, they wanted to know how a small brewery in California can make better German lagers than they make in Germany. And um, so I, I think that the, the, the global aspect of what's happened in America, there's now craft breweries opening in Japan and Brazil and China and um, you know, many countries. Italy has got a now a very vibrant craft culture. Uh, England, which had a, a reputation for being a great brewing country, um, all of their breweries were almost gone, the same thing that happened in America. And now the, the English craft brewers are buying American hops to make American-style craft beer in England. And so it's come full circle, and now if you're a, a serious beer drinker, you look to America for a great beer. Um, so we've, we've really been, uh, you know, sort of changed that whole dynamic significantly. Can you, can you do a, um, a state bottle beer for Chico? And... Um, could you tell the folks a little bit about that, and, and do you plan to do one for Mills River? Uh, yeah, the, the, the question was about estate beer. So we, I think, were the first to uh, brew a beer um, where we grew the barley ourselves, we grew the hops ourselves, we uh, used those ingredients uh, to make a all-estate beer. And the, the wineries have been doing that for years. You get an estate wine where the, the vineyards are at the winery. Um, but we purchased some property uh, a number of years ago uh, adjacent to the brewery, and, and we have a barley field um, as well as a hop field, and we've been doing some of that for 10 years or so. So we started brewing estate beer. Uh, we have uh, 
organic hops and organic barley, which is, is a, a challenge to do uh, in California, but we've, we've been doing it for a number of years. Um, doing an estate beer in North Carolina, I think the barley, um, we're actually trying to purchase some more land right now, which we'll probably grow some barley on. Um, growing hops out here is a bit more challenging. Uh, hops are very susceptible to mildew, and um, the humidity is not really very conducive to, to hop growing. So uh, there are some hop spring growing in the area, so it's not as if you can't grow them. It's just it's a challenge to grow them. So we may do one in the future. We don't, uh, we don't have any immediate plans, so. Ken, I noticed that uh, Blue Ridge College now has a whole complete brewing uh, curriculum. Um, how many of your brew masters here went through that program, and is this a unique program in the country, or would you say it's kind of isolated? Um, there uh, is a huge amount of interest, and I just actually yesterday had a conversation with uh, some other brewers about all of the programs that are opening up. Um, the, you know, I mentioned the one at UC Davis, and it's been going on, I think, since the mid-60s. Um, I'm um, actually on the selection committee for the uh, replacement uh, uh, dean of that program, or head of that program. I'm going to UC Davis next week to, to look at the succession so that they can maintain a, a really brewing, uh, a strong brewing university program. Um, the commitment at that level is significant. The, um, uh, the professor is a very renowned um, brewer, uh, worked for Bass, uh, PhD, very, very studied and, and has written dozens and dozens of articles. Um, so that's probably the, the, the top kind of program. Um, in, in Europe, there are many that are in that same league where there's lots of PhD brewing professors teaching them. Uh, a lot of the programs um, in this country that are, uh, are opening up probably aren't, aren't going to that level of, of engagement. Um, there's certainly lots to be taught, lots to be learned, and there's, you know, as I mentioned, a brewer a day opening up or more. Uh, there's a lot of need to train uh, brewing staff to, to get them to a certain level. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities both at the you know, sort of introductory level of brewing as well as the brewing science level where uh, it, it is a bigger commitment. Uh, Oregon State has a PhD um, brewing program, and UC Davis does, and there's a couple of private um, groups that are doing it. Um, there's a need for it, for sure, and um, you know, just making sure that the, the resources are, are there and that the talent is there to do the teaching, because uh, th there is a lot to, to learn and a lot to know at, at you know, a professional level. So um, you know, trying to get an accredited um, program, I think, would be key, and um, we've been actually talking about that at, at, at a high level of what is a, an accredited brewing program, because a lot of people um, probably would benefit from, you know, having a, a certain level of, of uh, knowledge and status. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, phrases, the terminology thrown around, pilsner, lager, and ale. Could you explain the difference between those three? Certainly. Um, I mean, it, tr traditionally, uh, there were two um, sort of styles of beer being brewed around the world. Um, there were top fermented beers, which are referred to as ales, uh, and bottom fermented beers, which are referred to as lagers. Um, the word pilsner comes from pils in Czechoslovakia, uh, where a certain style of lager was developed, and, and it was distinctive because it was brewed with very soft water. Uh, almost exactly like our well water, actually, uh, at Mills River. Super soft, almost no mineral content. And it brewed a very soft and, and different kind of, of lager beer. And so it was called Pilsen, uh, or Pilsner, because it came from Pilsen. Uh, so a Pilsner is a lager. Um, today, the, 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 there's been a blending of, uh, of styles. So there are some big brewers who would brew something called an ale, but they use lager yeast because that's the yeast they normally use but they'll call it an ale. So ales typically have uh, more hop character and more esters, sort of stronger uh, fermentation aromas and flavors. Um, but historically, there was those two general styles, ale, top fermented, lager, bottom fermented. And here's one final question. Since this is a book fest, what made you write a book? And was it easy? 
Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a long story, and uh, initially my wife thought I was absolutely nuts, and, uh, and she may, may have been right. Um, the, uh, the point when I, um, a little bit of history, so I was approached by a friend of mine who's a, who a writer. Uh, he wanted to write a, a book on the history of craft brewing from the, the earliest pioneers, and I agreed to be part of that, and he came to Chico and interviewed me, and he was going to interview a, a few of the other founders, the, the brewers that opened up in the, the, the 60s to the 80s. And a few of them said no, and um, he had already uh, talked to a publisher, uh, Wiley, uh, which is a, a large business book publisher. And um, so his project got, got put on hold, and Wiley contacted me and said, you should write a book. And I was like, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to write a book. I'd written most of a book, or a, 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 I had a co-author on a book a few years before. I said, I'd never do it again. Um, <clears throat> so I said no, and they kept bugging me, and I kept saying no. And I was uh, with a couple of buddies uh, sailing in the San Francisco Bay, and. They had emailed me and said, we really want you to write this book. We'll, we'll help you. Um, and I had had a couple of beers. And I, I, <laughs> I, I, I said, uh, OK, OK, I'll, I'll do it. And so I agreed to do it. And then the next morning, woke up thinking that was stupid. And I tried to get out of it. And I had already sent the contract off. And they said, no, no, you can't get out of it. You already signed the contract. But we'll, we'll help you write the book, um, which they never, they really didn't. But. Um, <laughs> So I, I got back home and got back home and told my wife I'd agreed to do this, and she said, "Are you nuts?" And um, right about that time, I decided to build a brewery, and so the um, the book got put on the back burner. I had a contract with a, a, a date that got passed by nearly two years, um, and um, I would, uh, you know, when I had the energy, I'd, I'd spend a, a day or two writing. Um, my daughter Sierra and my my assistant Melissa. Um, took my two in the morning um, sort of um, the stream of consciousness writing, and they uh, uh, made some sense of it. But um, um, anyway, I, I guess it was a, a, bad, a moment of bad judgment um, that I decided to write a book. But no, in the end, it was, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was actually pretty fun because um, I'm a pack rat, and we had boxes and boxes of old records. and. Um, you know, original business plans and articles from the early 80s, and so I was able to dig all those out of storage, and I spent weeks, you know, going through uh, and remembering a lot of stuff I'd forgotten. So it, it actually was a pretty fun thing in the end. Um, it was painful taking the time, but it was uh, it was good reliving some of those memories. Have you started your next book yet? Uh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> We want to thank you all for coming. We want to remind you that we're here tomorrow. Ken will be back. And we have just a, a great show for you. It's all free. And uh, we'd love to have you come back tomorrow. We'll be in the building about 8.30. We'll be done by 3. You don't have to stay for the whole time. You don't have to buy a single book. But a few of us in here wouldn't mind if you did. Okay. So thanks for coming. Thank you.